Good evening. Welcome to our Bible study, PortlandBibleChurch.com. <laughs> uh, we're currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. I'm Pastor Gary Glenny. <clears throat> you can get uh, updates and uh, information as well as live streaming on Judy Glenny's Facebook page. You can also go to the website, again, PortlandBibleChurch.com, and at the top of the homepage it has services. There's a drop-down menu. You can go and link there to YouTube, and we post those classes after we finish up. And so they're available for you. We also have audio going back several years at the website. We are studying uh, this evening the doctrine or study of principles of leadership. So if you want to go to the website and check that out, you can go to the doctrine section, I believe, or so that special topics That's and right. special doctrines. Yeah, so they have the leadership, uh, principles of leadership there. So you can uh, get that because we're looking at those things during this evening's class. Our classes, of course, are tonight at 7 o'clock and again on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and 11.15. After our second service on Sunday, we sing the great hymns of the church for about a half hour. And, of course, after our class this evening, we have time for prayer meeting. So if you have prayer requests, praises, or thanksgiving, you can let us know, and we'll be sure to include you on the prayer agenda. I have a lot of people that have had uh, physical um maladies, including yours truly. So continue to pray for those who have some type of physical uh, impairment of some sort or other. So we need to have those prayer requests and uh, praises for deliverance as well. We also have class for the ladies on Wednesday. Judy Glenny, my wife, has class right here at two o'clock. She's going through the seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation chapter two and three. We've been noting again the importance of uh, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the greatness of our founding fathers in these United States. If you want information on that and the training that's available, you can go to patriotacademy.com, sponsored by a fellow by the name of David Barton and Rick Green, two uh, excellent presenters with regard to the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the founding fathers, and all of the documentation that is necessary to demonstrate why we have this great country. So check it out, <clears throat> patriotacademy.com. Also, if you're still concerned about the virus, you can go to uh, covid.daystar.com, covid.daystar.com. So if you can check that out, you can get any information there uh, that you need. It's our custom to take a few moments at the beginning of each of our studies for silent prayer. That gives you the opportunity to confess any sins that you're aware of. Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit brings to your remembrance any sins that you've committed, whether mental or verbal or overt. You can acknowledge them to the Father. 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we, believers, confess our sins, that is, name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins, <clears throat> he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We believe that picks up the ones that we've forgotten or just didn't know about, and thereby we fulfill the command that Paul has given us uh, to, to fill, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so with that in mind, and in preparation for our study this evening, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is alive and powerful, that it gives us everything that we need to understand in this life about who and what you are, your plan for us, our destiny, our relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, and many, many other things that are contained in the pages of your scripture. We thank you for the fact that you've given us your word, our Bible from Genesis to Revelation, inclusive and exclusive of other writings so that we can understand these things. We pray as we study this evening that you'd encourage our hearts, enable, challenge, and motivate us by the things we study, for we pray it in Christ's name, amen. The scripture says, cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved, casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word of truth this evening to the, to the book of Romans, chapter 116. 
Romans 1.16. As I mentioned, we've been studying the principles of leadership. There are 30, and of course, we've been taking our time. And I don't know about you, but uh, many I need these probably as much as anybody right now. In fact, the one that we just completed, number 12, recently said that we need to have uh, composure, particularly under stress. Well, all of us have had a certain amount of stress over the last year or two with regard to the virus and other things. Now we see that there's imminent war on the horizon over across the pond, and uh, we see that there are many things that would cause us to be stressed out. Uh, recently, I've had some uh, physical problems as well, and so all of us have stress of one sort or another. And so this one says that we need to remain calm uh, under stress. That was number 12 that we looked at. And of course, uh, re having a, a relaxed mental attitude, which sometimes is not as easy to do as we would like to believe. We can tell other people, just relax, take it easy, just trust in the Lord. But when things happen to us and we become stressed out, it's a little harder than the rubber meets the road and we have to apply those principles not to be stressed out. At any rate, that was number 12 that we looked at. We actually have four of these characteristics that actually begin with the letter C. I should have put them all together, uh, but they are number 12, composure, that is under stress, that we are simply remaining calm. The next one we looked at last week was confidence, and of course confidence is not the same thing as arrogance. Confidence means that you have training, proper training, and you uh, understand whatever it is that you need to with regard to your particular discipline or your field. And therefore, it's not kind of a false pride, but it's simply confidence recognizing that you've prepared yourself and therefore God has promoted you to the place where you can use that preparation and training. So that's the one we looked at last time. Coming up, number 14, is common sense <laughs> and, uh, and good judgment. I laugh because it seems like common sense today mm -hmm. has gone out the window uh, anywhere we look. Even our friends and colleagues many times don't seem to use the common sense that God has given us. Of course, common sense is what the Bible teaches, and it's not what the world teaches. And so we have to look at it perhaps as biblical common sense rather than uh, cosmic or worldly common sense. So we'll look at that. And then the fourth one uh, is courage. We don't see that until we get down to point number 23. So that's the fourth in our uh, four different ones that begin with C. And we finished up confidence last time, but I wanted to look at about six more passages just to tag on to that one. And the first one, of course, is over there in Romans 1, chapter 1, verse 16. And this is uh, typical of the ones that we see in Scripture that would have confidence. Of course, we're having confidence in the Word of God. So when we have confidence in our life, it's because of the Word of God, not just because of training and preparation, although that would give us confidence, hopefully, in our particular discipline. In verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Basically, the concept here is not to be ashamed of the fact that you're a believer, that you understand how to become a believer, and that you present the claims of Jesus Christ so that others might come to faith and therefore be saved. And so he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We find that a lot of times we don't like to speak up about the gospel because perhaps we don't want to offend someone who doesn't believe, uh, and they might feel that we're trying to push our religion, as sometimes people say, don't push your religion on me, but we're just to give information. Presenting the gospel is not trying to force anyone to do anything. It's simply stating a position and information, and the Holy Spirit does the rest. Sometimes people take terrible offense, so to avoid that, we just uh, back off, and maybe we feel like uh, we shouldn't say anything, and therefore perhaps shameful, uh, and uh, looking at the gospel as something we should be ashamed for. Of course, we're not, because it's the power of God unto salvation and to eternal life for all members of the human race. So what's to be ashamed of? Yet sometimes we feel that we should not present the claims of Christ because of that. We see the same idea over in the Old Testament. For example, in the book of Proverbs, if you go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 26, I just selected a couple of passages. In Proverbs 3.26, we read this. For the Lord will be your confidence. So if you want to have confidence, that's a point. 
uh, the Lord is our confidence. Outside of that, perhaps it's just uh, training and preparation in a particular discipline, but ultimately our true confidence comes from the Lord. And leaders who have the Lord uh, as their Savior, if they understand the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and are what we would consider believers in that God and in uh, his Son, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, we have confidence. So the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Uh, and so the Proverbs and many times amplify in the second line. The same thing is true over in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 26. Here it says, in the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. Now, we've noted that that word fear in the Hebrew uh, has two meanings depending on the context. Uh, we can be fearful of any situation that comes before us, and therefore we're, we're deathly afraid of something. But it also, in context, refers to a reverential awe, which is what it means here, to have awe and respect for the Lord. So the reverence or the respect and fear of the Lord, as it says, there is great confidence or strong confidence, and his children will have refuge. That is the children of God. Well, by faith alone in Christ alone, we become joint heirs with Jesus Christ and are therefore considered his children. And so it says his children will have refuge. And I like the next word, the reverence of the law is a fountain of life. The very fact that you have life, but not only life, eternal life, is courtesy of our uh, union with Christ and in, uh, in God, uh, that the one, uh, that one may avoid the snare of death. Death, of course, uh, has several meanings in Scripture. One is eternal damnation. That's not something that would happen to any believer. But we can also have uh, physical death, of course, which comes to all of us outside of the rapture generation. And then uh, the separation in fellowship from God, uh, which is kind of a temporal death when we have sin in our life. And so uh, it doesn't tell us exactly which death is meant here, but I'm suspecting it has to do with the believer uh, losing his temporal relationship or fellowship with God, because obviously we all are going to die physically except for the rapture. So we see here that the snares of death, I believe, refers to the believer having a temporal separation from God, what we call in the New Testament being out of fellowship. You need to keep a close relationship with God. And then in our own epistle, the book of Hebrews in chapter 3, chapter 3 and verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3, we've already studied this passage, but we see here in chapter 3, verse 6, more about the same idea, and that is in verse 6, it says, but those who are Christ, and Christ was faithful as a son over his house, uh, it says, uh, whose house we are, of course, we are the house, we're the dwelling, we're the bride of Christ, we're the body of Christ, and we're the body of believers, so we're considered here in the metaphor, the house of Christ, and it says, uh, assuming that we hold fast the confidence, our confidence, and the boast of our confidence or hope firm until the end. This, of course, is not that we could lose salvation, but that we keep confidence in the Word of God and in the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, all through our Christian experience, and therefore that we maintain that confidence and the hope that we will have of the time when we will join Jesus Christ at the rapture and be with him forever in the millennial kingdom and beyond. So we have this one, and then uh, we also have the other passages that I wanted to look at, just a couple others, in Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. Here it says, it's a trustworthy statement. In other words, that's another way of saying this is true, this is a fact. It's a trustworthy statement so that those who have, um, those who have, Let's see, I've lost my place here. Sorry about that. It's a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently. Well, in chapter 2, we have the outline of the incomplete uh, Christian life and many things that are pertinent by way of application. And so the things that we're to have confidence in are the entirety of the presentation of the New Testament canon related to the dispensation of the church. So he says, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good works. 
These things are good and profitable for men. So basically our confidence helps other people to produce the divine works that God <coughs> desires for all of us as believers to fulfill. And then one last one over in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. Actually, it's part of a sentence that deals with prayer. And here Paul says, uh, with all prayer and petition, and the imperative is please pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with an, uh, perseverance and petition for all the saints. He's requesting prayer for all the saints and his other believers and himself as well. And then he says here, and on my behalf, they've added the word pray because he is, of course, from the previous verse, pray on my behalf, that's for Paul, that utterance may be given in uh, to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness, there's our confidence again, with boldness, the mystery of the gospel. Now, the mystery of the gospel, of course, is part of mystery doctrine, which is the New Testament presentation of the person of Jesus Christ as the Savior. The Old Testament alluded to it, pointed to it, but it wasn't until Jesus Christ lived and paid the price on Calvary <laughs> and died and was resurrected that we really have the presentation of the gospel in our day. And therefore, we need to present that with boldness, he says, the mystery of the gospel as it is now presented through the dispensation of the church. That is, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we have everlasting life, forgiveness of sin and all the blessings that accrue. So I wanted to add those as kind of a postscript to number 13, confidence. So confidence and boldness basically comes through knowledge, but also through a relationship with God and his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, the next one then, and as I say, I need these as probably as much as anyone, uh, so I wanted to make sure that we uh, look at them uh, in a complete understanding. Number 14 is common sense. And as I say, whenever I say that, I have to smile because uh, we talk about today, it seems like people do not have the common sense that they were born with. Certainly our nation was founded with greatness and freedom and all the marvelous things that the founding fathers very meticulously put into the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and even all the writings and uh, uh, debate that surrounded those, which are multiferous. There were just many, many writings that are available of exactly what the founding fathers said and what they meant by what they said. It's kind of interesting today that people try to reinterpret the Constitution. And uh, of course, they try to find all sorts of loopholes. We've been studying that under our uh, different um, uh, classes on the Constitution, how the people today in Congress and even the judiciary are finding trying to make loopholes in the Constitution to fit things in there that were never specifically stated. And yet the founding fathers were very clear. And in their writings and debates about the Constitution, uh, by the time they had completed it, it with the amendments and all those things that were part of it, they felt like they had done the very best job. And of course they did. But today we see that people try to reinterpret this is what we think they meant when, of course, they stated in detail in many of their writings beside the Constitution exactly what they meant by what they said. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of trying to change it and make the Constitution and those writings be something other than they were, oh, well, it reminds me of the Scripture. The Scripture is very plain. It's literal in the face of it. And yet uh, we have uh, metaphors in Scripture. And so many in Christendom today, many pastors, many well-meaning people and some not so well-meaning, take the scriptures, particularly in the area of figurative language, and they just run wild. And they interpret the scripture in just any way they feel because of the metaphors. And yet I know there are metaphors in scripture, but always they refer to some uh, literal concept that is behind them. And so we see that over and over again. Uh, uh, for just one example, we've mentioned it many times. Uh, John said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Nobody would ever believe that Jesus Christ was a sheep. Obviously, he was a human being. He was the God, man, savior. And yet he fulfilled what the Levitical offerings taught by way of, way of offering up sheep and bulls and other sacrifices. So John recognizes that. And from the Old Testament says uh, about Jesus to the crowd, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We see it used again in Revelation multiple times through scripture. And no one would suggest that Jesus Christ is a sheep. And so we see that the metaphors have clear and literal meanings, even some that are more obscure than that, 
And so we find that people take those metaphors and they run with them and take all kinds of license and come up with the strangest things that were never intended by God in the scriptures or by those that he inspired to write. There is a sense that we have to find that is what was intended literally in the scriptures and live by that. Of course, that's not what we find today in many churches and even among many ministers here and there. So we see that the common sense then uh, is very uncommon. It's almost one of those oxymorons. We say, don't you have any common sense? And we see, well, common sense is very uncommon. We might say, don't you have some uncommon sense? That is to say, biblical sense, spiritual understanding rather than cosmic or worldly understanding, uh, which is what the world calls common sense. And of course, as we look around, we don't see much of uh, anything that is common. And I've added here good judgment. So with common sense, we have good judgment. The judgment is the ability to make a decision uh, compatible with divine norms and standards. We've already talked about the conscience on Sunday morning. The conscience is the evaluator of the soul. And of course, we put into that information all through our life. And many times there are erroneous norms and standards things that reflect the cosmic or the worldly system. And therefore, when we are born again, we get a restored or new conscience, and we have to fill it with divine norms and standards to replace the human uh, norms and standards. Of course, if we don't, the old ones go right back in. That's why we have to study the word of God to be approved of God, and therefore rightly dividing the word of truth. We have quoted it thousands of times in this local church, and it goes without saying that the word of God can be wrongly uh, divided, and therefore people come up with all sorts of ideas. A leadership, leaders then should have good judgment and common sense. Uh, after I've defined common sense as uncommon sense, and of course uh, this idea of good judgment, that is judgment that lines up with the will and word of God. If you define those words that way, which is what the Bible does and defines good judgment and what we're calling common sense, basically the book of Proverbs, as we noted several passages already, you can study from the first to the last verse of the book of Proverbs and you have spiritual common sense. You want to know what common sense is? The book of Proverbs will tell you from the first chapter to the 31st chapter, you have spiritual common sense. So if you want to have common sense and good judgment, uh, even as an unbeliever, look at the book of Proverbs in the Bible. Find one and just start reading it and it will help you to understand God's viewpoint on every imaginable subject uh, that you can uh, think up is there in the book of Proverbs. Well, a couple of Proverbs just to show you this. Uh, we see one over here that we'll start with and then we'll backtrack a little bit. Uh, Proverbs chapter 20. So we'll go over to Proverbs just for a minute and look at a few of these. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 8. This one is very appropriate for our day because we see on every corner, as it were, evil pursuits. And so in Proverbs chapter 20, Proverbs 20 and verse 8, it says, A king, now we're dealing with leadership, so here would be the ruler of a land, uh, a king who sits on the throne of justice. In other words, the king should sit on the throne of justice. I don't know if you get this or not, but this is a metaphor. He's not sitting on justice. Justice is a concept. They don't make chairs out of something called justice. Mm -hmm. So this means that his throne, his rulership, his, uh, his nation is under his jurisdiction and good judgment uh, resulting in good justice, the administration of justice. So a king who sits on a throne of justice, he rules wisely and justly and fairly, uh, uh, not, uh, and uh, well, let's go to the next, uh, despising all evil with his eyes. In other words, he can see uh, what is evil and separate from the good and the evil in the nation. This is a good leader, of course. This is part of spiritual common sense. It makes sense that leaders should be fair and just and uh, not prejudice one way or another. They need to make fair decisions. We see that many times leaders do not do this, and therefore they, uh, they take their, pr their pride and arrogance, and it colors their authority, and it destroys good judgment and common sense. Then we can go back over to Proverbs 21. Uh, uh, we'll go over to Proverbs 21. And in Proverbs 21, 3, Proverbs... Proverbs 21.3, it says, To do righteousness 
and justice is desired by the Lord rather than sacrifice. Uh, in the Old Testament, of course, uh, sacrifices were the issue in, as far as a training device or training aid, if you will, for understanding the means of salvation that would be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And so the whole sacrificial system we've been delineating out of chapter 9 of the book of Hebrews. And so uh, that was important because it taught them about the need for the shedding of blood for the remission of sin, which is fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. That's what we've been studying in Hebrews chapter 9. So it says, but doing righteousness and justice is more important. And even if you don't do the sacrifices, righteousness and justice, these are the two hallmarks of the Lord and as well as God the Father himself. In fact, some have suggested that the two cherubim or the cherubs on either end of the mercy seat, one represented righteousness and one justice. As they look down and cover their wings over the mercy seat, they, of course, are accepting the fact that the blood, uh, of course, uh, mediates for the justice of God demanding a penalty for sin and the righteousness of God demanding a perfect sacrifice. So whether that's exactly right or not, justice and righteousness combine to form the integrity of God. So God desires integrity from us because they are two characteristics of his own attributes or essence. Therefore, he desires that of us. To do righteousness and justice is desired more by the Lord than sacrifice. Obviously, there's a place for sacrifice, but above that is righteousness and justice. By the way, when you believe in Jesus Christ, you have his imputed righteousness in your life. Therefore, we're declared to be righteous. That's the concept of justification. Even though we're not righteous, God declares us righteous because we have accepted and the righteousness of God has entered into us by our faith alone in Christ alone. So we see this here in chapter 21, verse 3. And then over in chapter 29, I got looking at that and I couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. Chapter 29 is just such a great chapter. You might want to look at this for your homework tonight. We'll look at a few verses, but you can read the whole chapter. Uh, we'll just highlight Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2. It says, When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when wicked men rules, uh, when a wicked man rules, the people groan. I don't know about you, but it seems like a lot of people are groaning in our nation today because of the evil that we see in the leadership, not only locally, but in the national level. When a wicked man rules, people groan. When the righteousness increases, the people rejoice. So when the righteous increase, that is when righteousness uh, is found in leadership and rulers and nations, then the people rejoice. But when a wicked man is in position of authority, the people groan. That's just verse 2. We've just begun in verse chapter 29. Look at verse 4. The king gives stability to the land. How? By being a smiley face, being a nice guy? No, by justice. And what we're lacking today is justice, it seems like, at every position in our government, from local all the way to the federal government, justice, fairness, and taking things that are biblical, but more than that, as far as our nation, constitutional. Because the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, all of those are based whether you like it or not, on the Bible. We have hundreds and hundreds of documents, even within the Constitution. The idea of God's sovereign will and grace are found all through those instruments. The king gives stability to the land by means of justice, but a man who takes bribes overthrows it. It seems like today money talks and everything else walks, as they say in the vernacular. Uh, we won't tell you what everything else is, but money talks. <laughs> and it seems like in every place, in government, in business, in industry, in education, you name it. Sadly, even in churches, I hate to admit it, money seems to be the issue. People will do almost anything for money. You can just imagine someone in, uh, on one of these uh, campaigns in Washington who dumps $100,000 in the lap of a congressman and says to do thus and so, it'd be very difficult for the congressman to say, well, that just goes against my constituents, uh, what they want me to do here. Uh, I'm going to do what my constituents want. I'm going to follow 
the Constitution, and what you're asking is in violation of the Constitution and is directly in opposition to the constituents, that is, the people that I represent. Uh, and therefore, I cannot take your 100,000 or 10,000. Uh, I reject that. But we see that it's very tempting because money talks. And so people today in powers, positions, positions of leadership, very often are swayed. We see it in every field. Uh, we don't have to go down the list. You know what I'm talking about. All of us have been in the world for enough time to know that those people who have the money, uh, they have this, uh, uh, this concept. They say, uh, he who has the gold rules. That's the golden rule. If you have the gold, you rule. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you want to rule, you need the gold. And if you rule, you want to get the gold. And we were talking the other day about people who go to Washington or go into some type of politics. They may go in poor, but they come out millionaires. And of course, if they had to have a, an appraisal of their wealth after they went in as compared to when they went in, we see that many of these people have gone into politics simply for the money. Now, it's not just true of politicians. People go into other fields for that. Some even go into ministry, I can't imagine, but uh, they do. And, of course, usually when they do that, they compromise the principles of the Word of God, just as they do in politics, in industry, in every other field. They compromise principles of good judgment and common sense for money, for the for the dollar. So here it says, that's why it says, the king gives stability to the land by justice, but a man who takes a bribe overthrows it. A man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his own steps. I guess the good news is that those people who do these things ultimately get caught in the snare and they end up losing out, if not in this life, certainly in the life to come. But it seems like the evil live a long time and they do a lot of horrible things. Sometimes generations of people suffer. We think of the Israelites 400 years plus uh, in Egypt in slavery, basically, for most of that time. Uh, and it's uh, seems like, boy, I don't know, if we got 400 years of this kind of administration that we see now, uh, we'll be long dead before God ever rectifies it. So we just pray for deliverance from all the tyranny and evil that is now oppressing our nation, taking away our freedoms, violating our constitution, and all of the will and desires of our founding fathers. That's all I have to say about that, because mm -hmm. mostly I'm preaching, as they say, to the choir here. At any rate, let's go down to verse 11. In verse 11, a fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. Sometimes we hold it back when we need to be a little bit angry. And so it's legitimate for believers to become angry, but we have to be careful not to become violent, uh, not to lose our temper in that arrogance, or I'm sorry, in that, in that anger, uh, because uh, we need to maintain control so that we can present our case in the face of fools. Fools always lose their temper, but the wise man holds it back. Notice number 12, verse 12. If a ruler pays attention to falsehood. Boy, I, I could wax eloquent on this today. We see so many in various places, whether it's the local state or uh, federal government, we see people lying about every, every possible thing that you can imagine. And most of you are familiar with it. Some of it's being exposed, but some who have lied uh, double and triple down and just continue to lie and lie and lie. Here it says, if a ruler pays attention to falsehood, all his ministers become wicked. So when the leadership is lying, when the leadership is wicked, everyone under him becomes wicked. There was a, a, a fable one time, and it's very true, about the king with the invisible suit of clothes, if you remember it. And I haven't gone back. I'm not sure uh, who wrote that particular fable, but I love it because that's exactly what we see in so many areas today, that uh, people are telling a lie and everybody says, oh, that lie is true. And they all know it's a lie. And it takes someone to come along with spiritual common sense, like the little boy, when the king went by, he said, the king is naked. And everybody just went, oh. he actually said what everybody knew, what everybody was thinking, but no one wanted to say it because they all wanted to get the, uh, ad the uh, adulation of the king. Nobody wanted to be it, that they would contest the king and his rulership because of the falsehood. And that was the grandest falsehood. And that's certainly symptomatic of what we see today in so many areas that people lie and everyone around them adds on to the lie and says, oh, yes, oh, yes, I know that same thing. And of course, they become complicit. Here's your passage in Proverbs 28, uh, 11. If a ruler pays attention to falsehood, that's a lie. 
all his ministers, everyone in leadership under him becomes wicked. And so that's one you can take to the bank, if you will, 11 and 12. Let's go to 14. If a king judges the poor with truth, that is, if he judges correctly, those who are less fortunate, the poor, as we find them, Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with you. And therefore, a king needs to consider the poverty people in his place, in his uh, uh, administration. His throne will be established forever. So if you take care of the uh, down trodden folks in your system somehow. If you do that, of course, doing it biblically through the church is number one, but there certainly is a place for the government to help in these areas as well and not to uh, destroy the poor. And we noted that earlier uh, with regard to taking bribes and so forth. So his throne will be established forever if the king judges the poor in truth. Of course, if the king is uh, dealing with falsehood, all his ministers are wicked. Uh, they're not going to deal with the poor. And of course, many times uh, the poor would include the middle class in our country, as opposed to the ultra rich who seem to be exempt from everything. Once again, money seems to rule those who have the gold rule, you know, the golden rule of the cosmic or worldly system. And then we have, uh, let's see, uh, finally, the last one, verse 18. You can read the whole chapter. As I said, I came here for one verse, verse 4, and I went down through the rest of them and I couldn't let them alone because they're just so apropos. That's the thing about Proverbs. If you want to read Proverbs, just take it out sometime. Take your Bible out and start in Proverbs. You won't be able to put it down. You'll want to keep going because that's what happens every time I go to Proverbs. So it's a good thing to do in your Bible study uh, and in your prayer time as well. Verse 18, where there is no vision, uh, that is, the people are unrestrained. Some places in some text it says in su certain uh, translations, when there is no vision, the people perish. But the word there is unrestrained. They are let loose. They're, they're let loose in their soul. They're unrestrained. They get into violent situations and so forth. And the word vision, of course, has to do with not uh, seeing visions in the night, uh, seeing some type of apparitions or having a, an angel visit you. The idea here is information related to the word of God. Visions has to do with divine communication. Well, you can get divine communication out of the word of God. You don't have to have a vision. Daniel had visions. Nebuchadnezzar had visions. Many of the prophets had visions. Even Moses had encounters with the angel of Jehovah. That would be considered a daytime vision. He actually talked to the angel of Jehovah, the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, what did he get? He got the Mosaic covenant. He got doctrine. And so we might say here, where there is no understanding of divine communication, the people are unrestrained. They are let loose. They are empty of soul. And that's what we see today. People who uh, have no understanding of the word of God, not even in the area of divine institutions or divine establishment. If you were with us, we studied that several weeks ago on this, uh, in this class on leadership uh, up there under point 12, uh, the divine institutions or laws of divine establishment. We also looked at them in the book of Hebrews as a review on Sunday. So if you were with us, you found that as well. So there's the book of Proverbs expanded in chapter 29. You can read the rest of it for yourself. I hope you will for your study. And of course, uh, all of these things are, you, I mean, I just have to stop looking or we'll read the entire chapter, yeah. which is no bad thing. At any rate, that finishes up confidence. I know that was the subject for last class, but I wanted to get those. And so, uh, I'm sorry, common sense. And I did want to cover that as well tonight. Now, the next one is kind of our fun one, if you will. And that is that with all of this, we need to have a sense of humor and leaders need a sense of humor. I think one of the things that we notice today among leadership and really among the populace at large, people have lost their sense of humor. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say anything that's a, a little bit seems to be uh, off cue, people say, oh, 
uh, that's degrading to this person or that person. Look at some of the old TV shows. Uh, they, If they were being put out today, they'd probably be pulled off the air. Some of the things that uh, people said, because many of them were said in jest, and uh, there was no evil intent meant. But today we have to be so careful, because anything that you say could be construed as some type of prejudice, and therefore we've lost our sense of humor. It is odd that some of the comedians uh, that come from the, from the liberal side can almost say anything to hurt anybody. But when they come from the biblical side, or what we would call the conservative side, uh, these are always uh, marked as hate speech, and therefore uh, we see that uh, they do not see the humor in these things. And so one of the marks of a descending national entity is the fact that people have lost their sense of humor. So leaders need to have a sense of humor. By the way, it's attention relieving uh, means uh, and indicative of a relaxed mental attitude. If you've got a relaxed mental attitude, you can laugh at things, uh, and not, of uh, course, uproariously uh, as, uh, you know, just out of control. But uh, if you remember back, we have the program on television, MASH. Regardless of how you viewed that war or the Vietnam War later, uh, MASH, of course, took a humorous look at it. Even some shows uh, like Hogan's Hero took a humorous view at Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime, and there was nothing humorous or funny about it. And yet they took a humorous view of that, uh, kind of laughing at the Nazis with their foolishness and their evil, uh, vicious uh, uh, activities. Nevertheless, they had a sense of humor about it, and so uh, we need to recognize sense of humor is something that leaders need to have, and therefore this idea of a relaxed mental attitude. And uh, we can look at uh, several passages uh, that I have here. One is in Proverbs chapter 15. Again, Proverbs is the place where we find so many things related to spiritual common sense. And in Proverbs chapter 15, and verse 13, Proverbs 15 and verse 13, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face, but when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. And so a cheerful face comes from a joyful heart. What makes a joyful heart? Being able to laugh at things that are just plain silly and uh, humorous. And therefore, we need to have this sense of humor. We see if you go over just to chapter 17, just a little ways further, in chapter 17 and verse 22, we see here again, a joyful heart is good medicine. We might say laughter is good medicine. I've seen some programs on television where they say laughter is healing. If you can find things to laugh at, that actually is healing and it's medicine to the body. So a joyful heart is good medicine. You want some medicine? Get a good belly laugh uh, at something that is humorous. We see that in past times, the uh, uh, the comedians had humor that was uh, many, many times self-deprecating and things just about silliness in society without picking on individuals and trying to demean people, but rather just things that, uh, that we all consider kind of silly in our life, physical things rather than attacking people and trying to make light and humor of them, just things that were in and of themselves humorous and funny. <laughs> And therefore, a joyful heart is like medicine. Uh, it's even healing to the body. But the broken spirit dries up the bones. This, of course, is painful and brutal to the body. So we have then these passages as well as others. The critical passage that we might look at, uh, I'm not going to go into it because of time this evening, but you can read it for yourself. We have uh, Balaam and his ox the story where uh, one of the more humorous things where we see that God himself has a sense of humor. You'll remember that Balaam, as an unbeliever, uh, God used in a miraculous way the debate over whether or not he ever became a believer or was a believer. If he was an unbeliever, God still gave him prophetic words, and he was to give those to Balak with regard to Israel. Balak uh, was the king at that time of the unbelieving people. I think it was the Malachites, and uh, uh, he wanted and he wanted Balaam, who he thought was a prophet of God, and apparently God used him uh, to curse the Israelites. And he asked God, and God wouldn't do it. 
and he gave him information, and he kept going back to Balak and saying, well, this is what God said, and Balak kept saying, well, that doesn't curse him. I don't get that, and so he went on and on with this, and uh, uh, he never really was able to get a curse from God. The closest he came was that God told him, you know, that if the people of Israel allowed their daughters to marry into the pagan peoples of, of Balak's uh, people, uh, then they would be brought down. And of course, that was true. And so that's what Balak eventually did. But in the meantime, we see that Balaam was uh, trying to get away from God, if you will, and go on his journey. And the uh, angel, of course, stopped his donkey so he couldn't go through uh, on the way. And of course, Balaam got off and started beating his donkey. And the funny part was, if you haven't studied it, by the way, you can read the whole thing if you want as your own study. If I did it, we'll never get finished. But it was over in Numbers 22, <clears throat> 1 through 34. We might visit it again next time uh, and uh, look at a piece of it. But Numbers 22, verse 1 through 34. And there we see that Balaam's beating his ox uh, or his uh, donkey. And the funny thing, as I mentioned, was finally the donkey turns around and says, why are you beating me? And, and the donkey's speaking to him, and it doesn't even occur to him that that doesn't make sense. Animals do not speak, I mean, other than parrots and some that mimic. And I can't imagine, oh yes, we have the serpent in Genesis, uh, but to, other than that, animals do not speak to us. And this, this donkey was speaking, telling him, why are you beating me? And so he was so upset, he didn't recognize the humor that God was using an animal to give him information that he needed about his bad behavior. And so we see that God has a sense of humor, simply using an ox, I'm sorry, using a donkey in this case, uh, to present information to Balaam in this particular situation. Well, uh, laughter then certainly is a good medicine, a joyous heart. Heart, and of course, a sad heart uh, brings about a broken spirit and dries up the bones as it were. Again, a metaphor. Your bones don't dry up, uh, but it seems like your soul is dry and thirsty for truth and the word of God. Well, the next one then is loyalty. Loyalty, of course, uh, has to do with the leader's ability to dedicate, particularly devotion to duty. We've heard a lot about devotion to duty as we've been studying the Constitution. And those who went to Washington and uh, to Philadelphia, actually, to do the Declaration of Independence and later the Constitution, they felt devotion to duty. And they understood it was their duty to their nation, to the nation that they were trying to establish, to do those things that were just and fair and to do them under God. They understood that God was over leadership. He was over government. Today, we have got the idea that government is the God and is over everything. But the founding fathers recognized that the sovereign creator was over everything first and that those under him were leaders and had authority given by God uh, by the people and by God to function uh, over the national entity. So we see that duty is very important for leadership. Duty, of course, we would see in leadership, loyalty to the instruments of freedom in that nation, such as our Constitution. In Israel, the Constitution was the Mosaic Covenant. And so we have uh, the various aspects of the Mosaic Covenant, which was the Constitution of Israel. It's the longest running Constitution in history, perhaps our Constitution, the greatest one of a secular or Gentile nation in the world, and of course, certainly in the world today, and it's being undermined, sadly, by so many. So we see devotion to duty, dedication, and loyalty. But remember, uh, obviously, uh, to, to, to devotion to duty and purpose, to personnel, however, they must recognize authority wherever it's found. And here's the most important thing as we close. Loyalty must always be to principle first. Loyalty must be to principle first. That would be the principle here. Uh, you can be loyal to people, but if people violate principle, then you have to forego loyalty to those people. Even a nation, if the nation foregoes principles, then your loyalty and duty to that nation is in jeopardy, and you have to decide whether you will violate uh, that authority at peril, perhaps, of your own life and freedom, because we have to be loyal first to principles. For us, those are principles from the Word of God. 
Note these characteristics, as I mentioned before, are rarely found in times of national degeneration and historic downturn. This idea of loyalty to principle and to duty, just as we noted a sense of humor usually missing in times of national degeneration. Well, these are principles, whether or not our nation and the leadership in our nation will adhere to these and come back to the principles of establishment. This is something we need to pray about. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity of studying these things, these principles of leadership. We pray that somehow we can instill these in the youth of our nation, even at this late hour, and that we can save our nation from destruction and the loss of freedom and the tyranny that is seemingly coming upon us. We pray that you would have mercy on our nation. We pray that you would speak to the leadership through your Holy Spirit, convict them of their sin and their evil doings so that they might understand at least the principles that you have designed for the human race and for governments and national entities, even if those individuals do not come to faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. However, we do pray that they might have an awakening and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here this evening without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want you to know that God had you in mind when Jesus Christ came into human history as the God-man Savior. He bore the sins of the entire human race, yours, mine, everyone, once and for all time on the cross, once and for all people. And you can have everlasting life, forgiveness of sin, and a resurrection body and all the things that accrue to you as a believer in Jesus Christ simply by believing in Jesus Christ. Believe what? Believe he was the God-man Savior. Believe he lived a perfectly sinless life, but most important, that he died on the cross for your sins and paid the debt so that you can have everlasting life, forgiveness of sin, and a joint heir place with Jesus Christ and all of us in the palace in that heavenly Jerusalem. Won't you do it before you leave? God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely appointed son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Believe in his son who was appointed by God for that purpose. And of course, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We see in John's first epistle, he says he writes these things and he says, I've written them so that you who believe in the name of the son of God, in order that you may know that you have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, now thank you for this time of study. We thank you for these principles. We pray that God, the Holy Spirit, would encourage, motivate, lift us up, and challenge us by these things. For we pray it in Christ's matchless name. Amen.